we're going to have uh, Dr. Mark Jacobson, who is the director of the Atmosphere and Energy Program at Stanford University, tell us about a, uh, uh, some, some assessments that he has done showing how we could possibly meet those goals without nuclear. Thank you, Dr. Jacobson. That's me. So I'm going to talk about how to repower the United States and the world, in fact, with entirely clean and renewable energy without nuclear, without coal, with carbon capture, without natural gas, without biofuels, at low cost, and keep the grid stable. So how do we do it? It's all with wind and water and solar power. So we have to transform all energy sectors. It's electricity, transportation, heating, cooling, industry, agriculture, forestry, and fishing. And the idea here is to electrify everything, then provide that electricity with clean, renewable energy only. So for electric vehicle, for, oh, sorry, for transportation, we'd use electric vehicles. And some for long distance transport, like even long distance aircraft, long distance ships, long distance trucks, hybrid hydrogen fuel cell with electric uh, tra drive trains. And for heating and cooling, we'd use heat pumps, uh, which are, uh, extract heat out of the air or out of the ground or out of water for heating and also can be run in reverse for air conditioning. They run on electricity, they're very efficient. For stoves, we'd use induction cooktop stoves, for example. They run on electricity that are just, heat, just as fast as gas. And for industry, we'd use lots of high temperature industrial processes, electric arc furnaces, induction furnaces, dielectric heating. And, and then all the electricity would be provided by wind, onshore and offshore wind, concentrated solar power, photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, existing hydroelectric power, and small amounts of tidal and wave power, and uh, minor amounts of geothermal as well. For storage, for storage, we would use for electricity uh, concentrated solar powers associated with storage, pumped hydroelectric power. Uh, existing hydroelectric power is basically a big battery that you can discharge as, as you want. And batteries actually would be the last option. In fact, I'm going to show you solutions. You don't even need batteries. But for stationary storage, that's also an option, but a more expensive one at this time. For heating and cooling, uh, we would we simply use water, ice, and rocks in soil. And I'll show you examples of that in a second. And for other, we'd also, hydrogen is a form of storage. And we'd also use what's called demand response, which is when utilities give people incentives not to use power at certain times of the day. And of course, energy efficiency is built into this as well. But just to give you an example of some existing low-cost storage, ice. Uh, my university, Stanford's had a big ice cube under a building since 1998. And instead of using air conditioning in the afternoon, for which is the peak time of the afternoon when you, most people use the air conditioning, they actually freeze ice at night using low-cost electricity. And then during the day, they run water through coils in the ice to cool it and use that to cool the buildings. And similarly, the university also just last year bulldozed a natural gas cogen plant that provided 80% of the heat and electricity for the campus and replaced it with two boilers and a chiller and solar PV because a lot of uh, energy is wasted just by creating cold and hot. And if you actually capture that energy, store it in the boilers and the chillers and recirculate it around campus where it's needed, you can eliminate lots of energy use. So those are two types of uh, cheap storage. And to give you an idea, this ice storage is about $30 to $40 a kilowatt hour compared to batteries, which are about $300 a kilowatt hour. Um, another kind, seasonal heat storage, uh, Arnon mentioned about, it's hard to keep you know, uh, seasonal energy because there's big fluctuations in demand uh, seasonally. Well, this is a town in Okotoks, Canada, south of Calgary, about one hour. Uh, about 12 years ago, 52 homes were built where they have a hot water, cl sorry, collectors on, their, uh, on the roofs of garages that have a glycol solution. Sunlight hits that solution, heats up. The solution then gets passed through water to water in this building on the right. And the water then gets piped underground under this field, which is a play field. It's a park surrounded by homes. And they have rocks. They excavated that field, put in rocks. The hot water heats the rocks up to 80 degrees Celsius. It's stored until winter time where it provides 100% now of the heat for these 52 homes when there's snow on the ground. So this is an example of seasonal heat storage. This costs $1 a kilowatt hour compared to $300 a kilowatt hour for batteries. Now, can we actually match all power demand worldwide with clean renewable energy? So here are the numbers. The end use power demand for all purposes in 2012 was about 12.1 trillion watts or terawatts. If we go to 2050, that goes up to around 21 terawatts. But 
if we electrify everything and we provide the electricity with clean renewable energy and some additional energy use energy efficiency improvements, we get a reduction of power demand by about 42.5% because 23% of all energy worldwide is wasted due to the inefficiency of combustion versus electricity. Another 13% is wasted due to the energy used in mining, transporting, and refining fossil fuels and uranium. And then there's an additional 7% energy efficiency improvements you can get from uh, just beyond the business as usual expectation. So we go down to 11.8 terawatts of energy, which is needed if you actually electrify everything and provide that electricity with clean, renewable energy. So we're going to try and match that 11.8 terawatts. So this is one way to do it uh, worldwide. It's with 1.6 million onshore wind turbines, 935,000 or so offshore wind turbines, uh, and you can see the rest of the numbers. But onshore wind is 23.5%, offshore is 13.6%, residential rooftop PV is about 16%, commercial government rooftop PV is about 12%, solar PV power plants around 20%, CSP power plants is about 10%, geothermal is about less than 1%, hydro, which all exists today, is around 4%, and then tiny amounts of tidal and wave. That's providing all energy to power the entire world for all purposes, eliminating all global warming, eliminating four to seven million air pollution deaths per year, providing energy stability. And you might ask, well, how much land does that take? This is the requirements, the land requirements. Uh, for the onshore wind, it's 0.92% of the world's land area for spacing between wind turbines, which can be used for agriculture or open space or rangeland or farmland. Uh, you, the PV, utility scale PV and CSP takes up about 0.22% of the world's land. And rooftop PV doesn't take up any additional land. Geothermal hardly takes up any additional land. There's some offshore wind. But we're talking about around 1% of the world's land to repower the entire world for all purposes. That does not talk about eliminating, that doesn't even account for eliminating all the fossil fuel and nuclear infrastructures. Now, what about keeping the grid stable? So we did plans for 139 countries of the world and for the 50 United States. And then we've broken up the 139 countries into 20 world regions. And then we've looked at, we've modeled the wind and solar output based on the number of wind turbines and solar panels, et cetera, in each of these countries over so far a four year period. Every 30 seconds for four years, we have intermittent wind and solar output and all the other output from the other uh, technologies. And then we compared those, the demand or the supply, with the load for energy. We got load data for over 100 countries. And we were able to then estimate what the loads were in nearby countries as well based on that. And then we ran this through a grid integration model and added storage, all the low cost storage that I talked about, and no batteries in these simulations, uh, just CSP with storage, uh, pumped hydro storage, hydroelectric power, and water, ice, and rocks for heating, hydrogen, and also some demand response. And so I'm going to just show you, run really quickly through the results for all 20 world regions. But the summary is that we were able to keep the grid stable in every single region of the world, 12, 20 world regions. Here, that was the US, and North, that was North America. Here's Central America. Here's uh, Cuba. OK, this is all these graphs show the red is energy supply, the blue is demand, plus change in storage, plus losses, plus shedding. So it accounts for everything. They match exactly for all four years, all 20 regions. Here's the Haiti, Dominican Republic, uh, Jamaica, South America, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Southeast Asia, Philippines, Japan, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, China, Hong Kong, Mongolia, North Korea, Russia, Georgia, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Central Asia, Middle East, Europe, uh, Iceland, Africa. Those are all the, the whole world we kept stable. So it's, it's no longer true that renewables cause the grid to be sta uh, unstable. This is actually a solvable problem, and this is a, that's a way to solve it. Here's the cost of energy that results. For all the average cost among all the countries I just showed you, all the world regions, is 9.8 cents a kilowatt hour for the electric portion of the cost if you want to compare to business as usual electric. Uh, all energy is 10.7 cents a kilowatt hour. But to compare with the fossil fuels, which are also 9.8 cents a kilowatt hour for the direct cost of energy, fossil fuels also have another 12.7 cents a kilowatt hour in health costs and 15.8 cents a kilowatt hour in climate costs. So cost a total of 38 cents a kilowatt hour versus 9.8 for wind, water, solar. 
Why not nuclear? It's six to 24 times more CO2 per kilowatt hour than wind. Before, uh, it takes 10 to 19 years between planning and operation. While the construction time can be from four to nine years, the actual siting and getting a permit for the site and then the construction permit and issue is actually another six to 10 years. So you have to add those together and you get 10 to 19 years. It costs 2.5 to, to four times that of new onshore wind and utility PV. It takes two to 10 times longer than to get 25 to 40% of the CO2 savings per dollar than wind or solar. So it's not as good of a solution. The Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change also says there's robust evidence and high agreement that increased use of nuclear leads to more weapons proliferation risk, weltdown risk, melting risk, and we can, so why, let's, let's look at can you use nuclear to solve the global warming? No, you cannot. You need to have 1.5 degrees warming. 1.5 degree warming is what we're trying to get to. It's impossible to solve global warming. It's impossible to solve global warming with nuclear because it takes so long just to get it to operate. You need 350 to, you can allow 350 to 575 gigatons of CO2 emissions after 2015 to stay, stay below 1.5 degree warming. Converting 80% wind water to wind water solar by 2030 and 100% by 2050 emits 415 grams of CO2, kilogram, gigatons of CO2, limiting warming. But nuclear, it's impossible because it takes so long just to plan, permit, and operate a plant, it's absolutely impossible to actually solve the global warming problem with it. So I'm just going to leave you at these slides. Oops. Uh, and leave you at these slides. Uh, about, we found that we can keep the grid stable with 100% wind, water, and solar. Uh, nuclear can't solve the problem. The cost of energy from wind, water, and solar is low. It's not. It's. it's I'm not saying it's the lowest cost, but it's a low cost that you can solve these problems with. And if you're interested in slides or graphics, uh, here are some. Uh, Here's some websites so you can get more information out. Thank you very much.